Good morning, and you are all very welcome to this special event jointly organized by the Institute for International and European Affairs and the French Embassy here in Ireland to mark and also to celebrate International Women's Day. I'm Martina Fitzgerald, and I'm delighted to be chairing this discussion with three very distinguished and also very successful women from Ireland, France and Mali, who have each served at a senior level in political life. So we are delighted to be joined this morning by Frances Fitzgerald, who is a member of the European oh. Parliament representing Dublin and a former Thonisha, Kadia Tu Kornare, the Minister for Culture, Crafts and Tourism of Mali, and Najat Vallaud Belkassam, the Director of One France and a former French Minister. Now, before we begin, I would just like to run through the format of today's event. I will shortly hand over to the French ambassador to Ireland, Bonsan Giron, and the cultural councillor of the French embassy here in Dublin, Mariam Diallo, who has been instrumental in organising today's event. I will then formally each introduce each of our guest speakers and get their perspectives on political life and decision making, also the role of education and uh, equality in society as a whole, and also their visions for the future post the pandemic. Now, this session will be an hour long in total, and one of our speakers, uh, Minister Konare, uh, will be speaking in French today. And we will have live French to English interpretation uh, throughout this discussion. And to avail of this service, you can simply click on the interpretation button represented by a globe icon at the bottom right of your Zoom screen and then select English in the language options, which you will see displayed. If you don't wish to avail of the service, you can click off and the instructions will be made available also uh, in, the, in the chat room. And there will also be ample opportunity uh, for members of the audience to participate. You can submit your questions uh, with your name and perhaps your affiliate organization via the Zoom Rooms uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And please, please keep sending your questions throughout this morning's event because we are leaving time uh, to answer them. Now with that, I would like uh, to welcome the French ambassador to Ireland, Bonsan Giron, and the cultural counselor at the French embassy, Marianne Diallo. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Martina. Uh, good morning to our distinguished panelists and to the audience. Bonjour, mesdames. Bonjour à tous. I'm especially pleased and honored to open this debate on the International Women's Day. This year, France and Mexico will also be co chairing the 2021 Generation Equality Forum in French Forum Génération Égalité a global gathering for gender equality organized by UN women. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Fitzgerald. Merci, Madame Connery. Merci, Madame Malo Belkacem, for your participation to this exchange. And thank you for IEA for organizing it. And I also want to share my speaking time with Mariam Diallo, our cultural advisor at the French Embassy, who has enthusiastically and resolutely carried out this project at the French Embassy in Ireland. Thank you, Mariam. Merci, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. It is a great honor for me to be able to bring together three countries that are so dear to my heart, Ireland, Mali, and France. Even though the role of women within political institutions has increased in recent years, we know that the road ahead will still be challenging. Allow me to express my admiration of our distinguished panelists coming together from different backgrounds and cultures. Thank you for being here. While the COVID-19 pandemic has placed women all over the world in even more precarious positions, this International Women's Day, your journeys and your testimonies will be incredibly encouraging for the future and for a more equal recovery for women all over the world. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam, and thank you, Ambassador. And now I'd like to introduce our, our guest speakers. We're delighted to be joined this morning by Frances Fitzgerald, an MEP representing Dublin. Frances has served in national politics for more than two decades. She's a former Thornista who has held numerous high-profile cabinet ministries, including justice and equality, 
Business, Enterprise and Innovation and Children and Youth Affairs. She has also served as a chair of the National Women's Council of Ireland, vice president of the Women's Lobby and is currently a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, as well as the Development Committee in the European Parliament. You're very welcome, Francis. We're also uh, joined this morning by Katia Tu Conieri, who is the Minister of Culture, Crafts and Tourism of Mali. She is well known in the world of African publishing, is passionate about culture and is also a human rights activist. She also founded a publishing house which has made a significant contribution to African heritage. And under the direction of the Malian journalist Ramata Diaulu, she brought together key figures to write the collective work about the Women's March, a chronicle of the Malian revolution. Now, finally, we would also like to, to welcome Najat Fallo Belkassan, who is the France Director of One, an NGO campaigning to end extreme poverty and preventable diseases. She also has a distinguished political career, serving as Minister for Women's Rights and was a government spokesperson under President Hollande. And she also holds the title and the distinction of being the first woman in France to be appointed Minister for National Education higher education and research. You're all very welcome. And we truly do have a very distinguished panel, panel this morning. And finally, if you do want to get involved in this, this morning's webinar on social media, you can use that uh, the handle on Twitter at IIEA and at France in Ireland, as well as using the hashtags, hashtag IWD2021 and hashtag choose to challenge uh, which of course is the theme of International Women's Day. And this event is public and it has also been live streamed on YouTube. On, uh, YouTube. So without further ado, let's begin our discussion. I would first like to turn to our guest speakers and to Francis Fitzgerald. Francis, can you tell us about your own political experiences uh, in terms of seeking and entering office and decision-making in political life at a senior level? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, obviously, Martina, uh, thank you for that question. And uh, I'd like to also thank the Institute and the French Embassy uh, for having such an international panel and focusing on International Women's Day. And I suppose what I would say at the moment uh, in regard to International Women's Day is that it is a time for celebration, but also to, for taking an audit. Uh, with COVID and the implications of COVID and the differential effect it's having. My own political career, I never started out really um, uh, to be a politician. I was a social worker. I did a basic social science degree and then I did a master's uh, in social work. And it was really my experiences of both uh, my social work in London and Dublin and seeing social problems as they emerged that gave me uh, a passion, I think, for equality, inclusion and diversity. And that really I've carried right through my political career. And I've been very fortunate uh, and honoured to have the opportunity to be a minister, as you said, and to work on those issues at a ministerial level and to bring forward legislation in relation to those areas. And I suppose when I was working early on as a social worker in Ballymun in Dublin with community and with families, I, I focused on uh, work with families and children in the early years. It was ironic then later on I became not really ironic, but I mean, I suppose I never expected it that I became the first minister for children. Uh, and it was really my work on equality, on women's issues, on reading books like Betty Friedan and the Second Stage, following American feminism, uh, organizing conferences here and bringing people from abroad to speak at them and, and sort of gaining understanding about the structural inequalities in our society. Uh, that led me into politics after having been chair of the Women's Council for four years. And, um, you know, I've had the ups and downs of any political career, and uh, you certainly have to be resilient, I would say. And I suppose the, the themes I'd focus on at present is that we, we still have unfinished democracies, as I would call them. Uh, we still lack the critical mass of women and men working together. We tend to have too low percentages in decision-making of, of women, uh, both in politics particularly, but in many other areas uh, of business as well. But I would say it's all changing. You know, we are on a journey. And, you know, again, well done to France and Mexico for doing generation equality uh, this year. Um, young women, I think, are becoming more and more activist. We're seeing the Me Too movement. I think there is room for optimism. But equally, we have to be very aware of the challenges still out there. When you think in America, for example, 
61% of those who, who go for food stamps are women. Uh, you think of poverty around the world. In Europe, you think of the gender pay gap, uh, still 14%. The pension gap is 39%. So there are many ongoing areas that we have to work on. And I started off by saying we have to recover from COVID and make sure that equality doesn't regress because that's the big danger at present, given the differential impact of COVID. So I would say it's a privilege and all of us here um, were ministers or are ministers. And it, it's fantastic because you can influence and you can bring about important change. And that's the privilege of being in politics, I believe. And that's why it is very worthwhile. And that's why we have to ensure more women uh, come into politics. But I've, you know, uh, being a mother of three sons has influenced me because you understand childcare issues in a very direct way uh, when you're facing them yourself. Uh, and there is evidence that women deal more with social issues and bring up social issues. By the way, Martine, I just discovered last night that there is one study showing that women are more active in politics and bring forward more legislation. I was delighted when I had found that. I, I didn't know that was true, but I, I came across one study in a book I was reading last night about that. So I think women contribute a lot would be my point when we're there. And certainly being in cabinet, and I'd conclude on this, I have seen the difference between having two women in, candidate, in cabinet, three, four, five, and out of 15. So again, getting that critical mass, I think, is really important. And that record of four Irish women in cabinet was actually recorded in 2014 when you were a minister uh, at that stage. And you've spoken about uh, how that changed the dynamic within cabinet. I'm next going to ask uh, Minister uh, Konare also about her political experiences. But first, I want to ask her about her outfit, because it is a very special outfit for today for International Women's Day and also has a link to some women who are working in your country. Uh, minister. Merci beaucoup, bonjour et bonne journée du 8 mars à, à tout le monde. Euh, je voudrais d'emblée préciser un élément qui me paraît important, fondamental. Something, an element that seems fundamental to me. De la société civile telle qu'elle est admise par les organisations. I'm a pure product of civil society as it is administered by the organizations, nor a pure product of politics. But the meaning of my social and intellectual commitment, I think, comes really from political activism, the strength of political activism. And also involvement in the creativity of civil society. So when I came, I, I was appointed Minister for Culture, Arts and Tourism in my country. And I came with a background of commitment as a, as a, as a fighter, a social and intellectual fighter. More and more, I realize that being in politics means to try and translate a concrete, in a, to a concrete act, our social and political commitment to make that put that into practice i'd like to come back to come back to this notion of intellectual and social commitment social involvement and commitment at least as far as i'm concerned comes from the heart of childhood from when you were a girl very young age you learn to take care of others to look after the family to look after your brothers and sisters i'm the eldest in my family so i was very young when i learned that i had respons the responsibility of looking after the younger ones very often in a big family the mother the aunt girl cousins and even grandmothers they all teach you to help one another to cook to look after the house to make the house a nicer place to live in. I remember, and when I think about this time of my childhood, I, I think that the principles were inculcated into me then. Very often I think about the responsibility I was given then. Early in the morning, before going to school, I was the one who had to prepare food for my grandmother. 
I don't remember having missed doing that a single time. And you see, that gives you a sense of responsibility. It teaches you very young to look after the community. And then when you grow to be an adult, in my own particular case, but I think it was, it's, it's the general case in Mali because we have a community education which is, is based on tradition and our cultural values. So for myself, in my life as a woman, when I became a mother and the head of a, well, the mistress of a household, I learned, I saw what I had learned from generations in my country which was that well-being in the country, it, the responsibility for that really rests on the shoulders of the woman in the house. So on the woman, you have to look after children, not just your own, but other pe others as well. Cousins for come to the house, nieces and nephews, sisters-in-law, mothers-in-law, you have responsibilities on all sides. And it is the woman in the household who has to handle all that. She has to see that it all works well. And I think she is never forgiven if she falls down in those responsibilities to look after the family and others. Very often, we're the first to get up in the morning and the last to go to bed because it's up to us to look after everybody else. Women in Mali, there too, I think, as the woman in the household, I think I can, I can say this, you have a thousand tasks that you must take on. And sometimes you are absolutely exhausted. So let me tell you this. Sometimes I think that women in Mali are heads of state. When you look at everything they can organize and, and, and keep running and they take leadership naturally, which I think is a fruit of their education, which as, as, as I say, is passed down from one generation to another. But it's also a product of the way that the family unit is organized, where everything yet again is the woman's responsibility. But women do that very discreetly. There's a saying in our country, which says that from in the farmyard, the hen knows that the day the sun has risen, but she lets the cock sing. So the cock crows. So that's to talk, say about the discretion with which women take on all these responsibilities. So to conclude, I would say that that prepares us to assume leadership, whether political or social. We are naturally disposed and in a good position to take on leadership. And the condition of women, situation of women in Mali is the fruit of education and of a voyage, which I would say is the, the journey of women in Mali. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and also for, I suppose, really dealing with one of the main obstacles for political participation by women, childminding. Just to remind everyone that um, in relation to the interpretation, <laughs> you're to, in relation to the interpretation, when the speaker, when speaker, the minister is speaking, if you press French to hear the interpreter. And now we're going to move on to our next guest speaker, Najat Vallo Belkacem, uh, the director of One France, to talk about her experiences in political life. Hi, uh, from Paris. I'm so delighted to be part of this wonderful and powerful panel. Thank you very much for your invitation. Well, uh, to try to answer your question, um, I was absolutely not predisposed to enter in politics. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, I was born in Morocco. I arrived in France uh, only when I was four years old. I did not speak French. 
So my childhood was not filled with politics in, um, and especially since uh, my parents didn't vote. Uh, that didn't mean I didn't have any commitments, but I have been fighting poverty and inequalities uh, in NGOs from a very young age. Um, and I certainly was not imagining myself as a politician when I was a kid. So I truly started to take interest in politics um, after high school, when I studied law and then joined uh, Sciences Po, which is a high school, uh, which made it possible for me to do internships in this area, for instance, in the French National Assembly. And this made me better understand how legislative action works and how, as a politician, you could change things for the better. And what made me finally go into politics was the 2020, uh, 20, um, sorry, uh, 2002 presidential election in France, when the extreme right candidate uh, arrived in the final round of the election. And that was a pure shock for me and for many people who absolutely did not expect that to be possible. This event made me realize that uh, I had to do something for my country and for the values I believed in because I had a voice and uh, willingness to, 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 make a, to make friends a better place. Um, having a, a family coming uh, from abroad was a, a true opportunity for me because it made me see the world differently. It gave me uh, the ability to adapt myself to different situations and to understand very diverse points of view. Uh, it wasn't uh, as obvious uh, when it comes to being a girl. Uh, as a teenager, being a girl meant uh, that I had a bit less opportunities than my male relatives for going out, for example. So that made me quite mad. <laughs> um, most importantly, I witnessed that uh, for my mom, for instance, being a girl meant that she had less autonomy and uh, had had uh, way less opportunities to study and live the life she wanted. So that certainly made me a feminist very early. Um, and uh, a huge believer in gender equality. Um, being a woman in politics hasn't always been a hassle, but it certainly makes you feel, because that's true, as an outsider. You obviously have to fight against stereotypes, not just gender stereotypes, but in reality, all kinds of stereotypes. And I've learned with time that um, the best way to answer them and to answer the criticism uh, was humor and uh, turning them into derision. I also think it's important to understand that during a debate, for instance, if you are being interrupted by a man, uh, it's not because you were not firm enough or authoritarian enough. It's only because for years and years we have been taught that some voices matter more than others. That's what, what we call patriarchy. So instead of questioning ourselves, we should look up to people like uh, Kamala Harris, for instance, who did it very well during the pre presidential debate in the US by asking to finish what she had to say. And we uh, women have uh, as much to say as men. We should believe in our expertise and our knowledge, but that's not something that is easy to do. Uh, there should be a lot of training and education around that at all ages, but also at school. And political norms, um, you have to remember that they have been built for men. So it's taking a long time to change mentalities and it, also requires a lot of adaptability from women to fit into this political system. I think that is really the, the, the few lessons that I have learned uh, of this experience. 
is there. And I'm going to, to return to that theme now with all of our, our guest speakers, starting with Francis, because I, I want to get your assessment of gender equality in society and particularly education. Education has been highlighted by the United Nations as the fourth sustainable development goal, gender equality the fifth. So what progress has been made in relation to these and what obstacles remain, Francis? Well, I think it's very clear that in Ireland, huge progress has been made. If you think that there's a marriage bar only back, you know, until 1972, and there weren't as many women going to third level and getting further training and so on. And when I'm in the European Parliament and I see the progress that has been made in Ireland, uh, despite outstanding issues, which I will address, um, when I see some of the attempt to row back on women's rights in some of our uh, mem members of the uh, of the union, uh, it's quite disturbing. Um, you see people uh, and politicians uh, from certain member states who do not want to use the word gender equality now. You see people rowing back on on rights. Um, you see LGBTQI rights being, uh, you know, people saying we, we can't have this. We want, you know, LGBTQI uh, zones and so on. Really disturbing human rights issues uh, continuing uh, within Europe. But I would say that from an education point of view, tremendous progress has been made in, in breaking down stereotypes, I suppose. Um, you, you, I mean, very early on, when I was in my uh, political career, we were looking at textbooks that had very uh, stereotyped in school books, really stereotyped stories about young boys, young girls. I think we're changing all of that. We're opening up the world far more. Uh, to uh, young girls uh, and, and, of course, uh, young men. And I, I think that's really good. We see much higher numbers in universities. In many courses, we see, you know, more than 50% of, of females doing, whether it's law or medicine, so on. The issue is more as people progress in their careers and come up against the very issue that both of our uh, other speakers on the panel have spoken about, and that is combining work and family life, having the childcare supports, the caring demands, uh, the unequal division of care in our society and the lack of value on it really. Um, but from an opportunities point of view, um, it, there's still a class element, of course. There's still a socioeconomic uh, bar because of costs. And that is something we have to continue to work on. And there is another area where you're seeing um, inequality. And interestingly enough, Martina, it's in the uh, AI's uh, digital technology area. And connectivity is going to be so important for opportunities as we progress, uh, opportunities to get good health care, to get more education, smart agriculture and so on. Um, that is an area where, uh, for some reason, right across Europe, there is a digital uh, gap, there's a gender digital gap. And that's something uh, we really have to work harder on. And that is about women taking, uh, you know, the, the subjects of science and maths and so on, and young girls seeing that that is a potential career, because that's where the money is going to be. Uh, that can help deal with the gender pay gap and the pension pay gap. So I think in other parts of the world, we have serious issues. Like uh, during COVID, we've seen an increase, for example, in female genital mutilation. We've seen an increase in early marriages. Now, if you have early marriages around the world, less chance of education. Um, there's a real danger of um, both young men and young boys and girls dropping out of education with the consequences of COVID because education has been curtailed in, in many areas. So I think, you know, there are ongoing issues and I am reading about the, uh, the need to make up for the lost time during COVID as well um, with our, our young people. And many people are saying that uh, we may not catch up on some of the educational experience that has been lost around the world, that it's a real challenge. So I, I think education is clearly the key uh, for so much progress, for opening doors. It's a good news story in many parts of the world, um, but there are, there are still issues. And particularly then, as people progress in their careers, you end up having that gender pay gap. You end up maybe not having women at senior levels. You end up with uh, women being more likely to be doing the care responsibilities and more likely to suffer setbacks uh, in careers. Um, so th those are, that's kind of a, a broad answer to that question, Martina. Sorry, oh, you're on silent. In fairness, it was a broad question because there's so much you could talk about in relation to that issue. By the way, on the tech issue that you raised, 
Uh, there's some positive news today. Irish female founders have raised uh, more than 100 million for the first time, but just 16% of, of founders here are female. So there are barriers across the board, and you mentioned that in your speech. I now am going to move to the minister, to Minister uh, Konari, and I know you wanted to, to raise some other points, but uh, Minister, also in relation to dealing with uh, gender equality in society and in education in particular, which will be important to you. Thank you very much. Before replying to this question, I'd like to come back to the idea of commitment, which will be a kind of an introduction for me to in, in discussing the second question. I spoke about intellectual commitment. It's the basis of my everyday work. Very young. I had the opportunity to find, to discover the world of books, which is an opening onto the world for me, a way of going beyond borders. And perhaps through books to uh, get, to ca capture ideas of peace and tolerance and that kind of culture. So when I was studying, which I did completely different studies, they were scientific, but at that point, I decided to become a publisher because I remembered how important books had been to me. They were, and they accompanied me in my young years. And it, when I went to France to study, books were my my companion. I read hugely, and it really helped me to understand about the world and about the environment around me in France. So when it came to choosing a career, I was automatically drawn to publishing. I was trained and I became a publisher. So I was, my environment was that of a political activist. It was, I was, I had, so politics was a, was a deep part of me. And it seemed to me that a book was a perfect tool for doing politics and for promoting the emancipation, of, in particular of women, on different levels. But first of all, I wanted to facilitate for girls to, to have access to books. And then I wanted women to be able to express their thoughts, not necessarily by writing, but, and also who wanted to have a look at our non-tangible heritage, which is supported mostly by women. And, actually, and then through documentary books to document the commitment of women's struggles and particularly in politics. So in, the introdu in my introduction, when I was introducing myself, in fact, five years ago, I published a book you mentioned, which was a collaboration. And the, in this book, the thing was that five years ago, we were at a, a turning point historically in Mali. In March 1991, there was a, a big event which launched the democratic revolution in Mali and ended up with the democratic opening. And at that time, that was when politi politics became different and women became really important for democratization at this time. Because this event included suffering and violence and women were the first ones to be confronted with this violence. When young people went down into the streets, confronted by soldiers and bullets, it was the women who opposed this, first of all. It was women who put themselves in between the young people and the bullets. They were cannon fodder. And in this book, I wanted to pay homage to them, to pay tribute to them, and to remember how much women had contributed to this march towards democracy in our country. 
So if women, women hadn't played this role 30 years ago, women, Mali today would not be as democratic, democratic as it is. Women paid with their blood. They gave of themselves. And so they were, they were struck by bullets and, and children too. I interviewed women who had lost, some of them had lost all their children in bringing democracy to this country, which had happened because women were part of, were, played a, their role in, the, in that combat. And when power came to, when in the political power, women were not given positions in decision-making bodies at the start. And even today, there are questions which we have to discuss because in 2014, there were figures in Mali. We only had nine women uh, in out of 700 mayors, mayors, there were only seven women. And yet in Mali, adopt, in 2015 adopted a law, law 052, which stipulates a quota of 30% for elected positions and appointed positions. So despite all the commitment and by the sacrifices, and as I said, this natural inclination to, to, to be political and to have a place in political culture, women had a very, were very poorly represented. And I, I'd also like to mention culture because for me, the struggle for education is also a struggle for culture. For three or four decades now, national, at national level, we've had a, a, a unit for schooling for girls. This looks at the conditions at school and tries to promote education for girls at school. But in these 30 years, this NGO, in its last, one of its most recent reports, it underlines the fact that Mali is one of the 10 countries where the level of education of girls at school is, I think, is, is, is lowest in the world. So there's a, okay, so there's a battle for figures to go from up from 30% to, to, to go higher. So the problem is access to education, quite simply. How do we get girls into schools? How do we get them to, to learn numeracy and literacy so that they can be economically independent? Access to direct education can only happen informally. We need, and it needs to use the mother tongue. We have 13 languages which are actually used. Those are ones which we, so these are the languages we can, with which we can read and we can teach girls to read and to write and to learn to be autonomous and independent. But even among girls who do go to school, we still have to put more stress on a, a very big problem, which is um, falling out of school. It's one thing to, to get girls into school, but it's another thing to keep them there so that they, they go on and get a diploma, which will, that will give them, guarantee them a job. And that is a big achievement. The cultural problem is also a problem of battles. I like this word battle because it, it, it really expresses the struggle in these areas in which women have not yet won the battle. So culturally speaking, when we look at our historical legacy, we see the, the critical role that women have played whether it was back in the times of our big empires or 
during the revolution for democracy, women were at the forefront. We have to reintegrate them, give them back into this, this role, which they are so capable of playing. So in our, our heritage of skills and competence, if, if women are not there to pass on this, all this knowledge, these, this knowledge is going to disappear. Our, Im, our in, immaterial heritage will disappear. And when that happens and our culture disappears, a whole people will disappear at the same time. So it is so important in the battle for equality that women take their role as guardians of time, of traditions, and that that they should be given back their position in history, that it should be recognized so that so for the consolidation and the majesty of, of, our, of our state and of our people. And Minister, clearly, thank you. This is a very, uh, passion, you feel very passionately about this issue given the role of women uh, towards, uh, towards democracy in your own country and also in terms of those stark statistics that you have given us in relation to education, participation, uh, and, and uh, girls. So this is clearly a very um, issue that you feel very strongly about, and also it uh, gives us all something to think about in terms of the role of women past and also the potential of those young girls in the education system. Najat, you work for an organization and education i'm sure is very key in tackling uh, poverty and extreme poverty and you also have uh, obviously a record as distinguished record as being a uh, france's first you know woman to hold uh, the ministry of education effectively yeah um what is very frustrating about politics is that uh, sometimes good measures, obvious measures, clearly approved by the population, are uh, sacrificed for political maneuvers. That's often the case with uh, gender-related measures. As a Minister of Women's Rights and Education, I have been the target of many fake news surrounding a mechanism I wanted to introduce in schools, which would have included some education on gender equality and stereotypes for young kids. A huge backlash followed the introduction of this measure, even though it wasn't uh, radical or extremist uh, in any way. So, well, that's the first thing. Um, also, um, a difficulty in uh, assessing gender equality in our own countries and in others is the blatant lack of gender data. This is a serious issue because the lack of data also implies that uh, gender discriminations are always underestimated. It also makes uh, it more difficult to draft efficient public policies and to target the right audience. No data, unfortunately, often is a way to make the issue disappear because if we cannot quantify the issue, then it means that the issue doesn't exist. And third, I would say that uh, another major issue is uh, now COVID-19. We have to talk about it. Recently, it has been estimated that uh, we had lost 25 years of gender equality progress in only one year of pandemic. This is absolutely catastrophic. And for now, this is not addressed by governments through gender-specific measures. You know, after the first lockdown in France, I have published a book with a French philosopher, a book called uh, Society of Vulnerable People, Feminist Lessons of a Crisis. In this book, we assess the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality in France and in the world. Women have lost a lot, a lot in many areas during the pandemic. That's true in France. But the crisis has also uh, exacerbated vulnerabilities in countries with significant fragilities in terms of food security, economy. There, women have uh, also been the first casualty of cultural and individual violence, child marriage, unwanted pregnancies, school dropouts, genital mutilation. All these uh, phenomena are 
rising and Katia Tukon probably tell us more about that. But more generally, the crisis has wiped out decades of progress in gender equality by reaffirming women as heads of households, handling most of domestic and educative chores while also sacrificing their jobs when family needed to come first. The crisis has made domestic violence cases rise uncontrollably, un uncontrollably. Again, again, policy responses to those issues were crafted without the contribution of women, overtaken by the valued expertise of men in power. Women's reality was once more subordinated to the priorities selected by the political discourses, which are men discourses. So in the book, we explain, for instance, that care workers cashiers, health workers, maids, have showed during this crisis how essential they were to avoid a complete breakdown of our societies. Yet, those care workers are very poorly appreciated and recognized in France, and I think it's the same in other countries. And these jobs are mainly occupied by women. The COVID-19 crisis has brought to light the paradoxical nature of our current social hierarchies in which the most useful citizens are also given the least recognition. Indeed, the crisis has uh, impacted the vulnerable ones first and has highlighted inequalities. And it has also shown that all that sorry, that uh, at the roots of our social organizations disparities, at the roots, is this idea that a woman is always a little less legitimate, a little less competent, a little less important than a man. That's why I say that in many ways, this crisis has made women, the big majority of care workers, more vulnerable. So for me, that's a real topic that we have to, to face. Um, I don't want to be too negative, so I will try to end on a positive note. We, have, uh, we also have uh, to highlight positive changes. For instance, uh, in France, the extension of the mandatory paternal leave in France, uh, which is uh, interesting because uh, as Kadiatou said it, now we have to fight on the cultural level uh, to fight on the cultural level to end uh, patriarchy um, means uh, to, to make uh, men uh, as committed as women in the domestic life, in the, parent, in the parental life. So I think the progress have to be um, uh, uh, found in this area especially. some important issues there in you've raised some important issues there in in relation to COVID-19 and its impact on women and I'm going to ask the other panelists to very briefly if they can because we do want to get to some of our questions from our audience and we're, we're concluding at half past but Francis Fitzgerald if you were to to look at what you want to come out of COVID and your vision for the future very briefly um, what would you say? What would you identify as those key issues? Look, I, I, thanks, Martina. I agree with what Nasha has to say. I mean, COVID is the issue at the moment in terms of gender equality and the recovery from it. Um, what I want to see is the huge funds that have never before been available, the, the amount uh, from Europe going to each member state. I want to make sure that the recovery is inclusive of these issues around gender. So that, for example, we are taking account of the precarious position of women's employment. Women have lost more jobs in order for women to get back into the economy and to, uh, you know, have opportunities. The recovery is going to have to take that into account. It's going to have to have, you know, you can't just think, for example, of construction. 
Construction is extremely important, but you can create millions of jobs around Europe by building a care economy. So that is something we really have to deal with, the child care issue, uh, the care of the elderly. You've seen what's happened in long term care. So we have to be conscious that there is a differential impact from COVID and every recovery plan and every government policy going forward for the next number of years has to be aware of that, has to deal with it in its policies, in its programme for governments, in its actions. We also, of course, have to be very, and we haven't mentioned it to any degree so far, there has been a 30% increase across Europe of domestic violence. I can't believe we're still talking about domestic violence, but we are, sadly. So you need really strong support to the organisations working with women. We need to address this issue in our laws. Well, we've done quite a lot in Ireland. Uh, I, I was involved myself in bringing in the concept of coercive control and the definition of consent. These issues are very important. So uh, across Europe, we have to make sure that we look at the care issues that have arisen. We look at the access to health care, cancer screening, you know, whether it's um, breast cancer screening, access to sexual reproductive rights. This has all been interrupted as we have moved forward. And in my report, which was agreed by the European Parliament just two weeks ago, I look at the impact of COVID-19 in about seven different areas, the economy, domestic violence, healthcare, um, and so on, and make recommendations. And Naja made a point as well, and I'm sure Katia Tio too would agree as well, that you need gender disaggregated data. If, if you don't do research that's inclusive of women, for example, in medicine, we're not going to give women the right treatment. And that has been a problem over the years and continues to be an issue. So gender disaggregated data in all areas is completely critical moving forward. And government can lead on this and really point to the areas where we need to be addressing the inequalities. And of course, Martina, I'd finish by saying, you know, everyday sexism is something we have to watch as well, whether it's in the media or in the day-to-day -day experiences we all have, and particularly young women, when you think of the impacts of pornography and, and expectations of, you know, having to look a certain way, um, this can be very debilitating and actually stop women and young girls from even contributing in classrooms. So that's a broader issue we have to continue to address. And that's an issue that you have spoken about previously and expanded on the pressures and also the fact that it discourages women from entering politics and other professions in public life. Thank you, um, Francis. Minister, in relation to a post-COVID environment, briefly, if you could see that your visions for the future and what needs to be addressed, because we really do want to get to our audience questions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I think it's very important and very difficult to talk about the future today, to think about the future after this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. My priorities and my vision would be centered really on the different sectors that depend on this department, culture, crafts and tourism in my department. So for both crafts and tourism, there's the world was one way before COVID and different afterwards. So for some months, we have known that when the borders were closed, Mali still continued to have tourists despite the security situation. And it needs international tourists. We need a flow of visitors. Our tourism industry depends on it. And when tourists used to arrive, what do they what do they like best? What sector do they go to most? It was and that was crafts. They went to see the creativity of Mali's artists. So no artists, no development of crafts. So we have had to have a discussion about giving ourselves the resources to develop local tourism, national tourism, to allow tourism to survive. This is necessary because, as I said, there is the world before and the world after COVID. So the tools 
available to the tourist sector to promote local local tourism is really important. So where I'm concerned in my department, we depend on local resources in terms of women because it it is women who do most of the crafts, whether it's pottery or basket weaving or weaving, as we spoke about, or dyeing. These are very much women's trades. So we need to enable women to have economic benefits from this. So we need development of local tourism and women as resources. I have always said that women are the ones who are able to welcome people into the home and to, to look after the home. So when we think about hospitality, this is the art of welcoming people. I say to myself that this art of welcome needs to be transposed from the family unit to the national unit, to citizens. Women, women as women of the household could be the guardians of the city, so to speak, as they have this art of hospitality, which is absolutely essential in developing the tourist industry. When we think about culture, there are huge challenges. But we do have a vision. So when we came to this ministry, we very quickly began to organize consultations involving the different branches of the cultural sector. So what does that mean? So we would sit around a table, everybody from cinema, the technicians, the, the actors, the operators, camera operators, everybody to talk about the future of their, their sector. And we listened to everybody. And we did that for all of the different arts, music, dance, visual arts and everything. And out of this came a number of recommendations, the product of these consultations, and we are going to put these recommendations into practice. But I'd like to stress the fact that there's, we are in a very particular period in Mali. We have a transitional government. It is a government with a mission. It is a government that is going towards elections and that is preparing for the time after the election. So we have a responsibility. And allow me allow me to, to say this, to, to clean up the house. We want things to be clean so that those who come afterwards will be able to take advantage of the work that we have done and to to clear things up and to clean things up. Thank you, Minister. I'm just going to come in now because I know Najat has a, a half 12 end, whether you may okay. have a few more minutes with Francis. Okay. Uh, Najat, can I ask you, because some questions have come in from the audience, and I was just wondering, one is commending France and Mexico in relation to transforming the agricultural uh, systems, but also asking how can women have a greater influence in agriculture and food systems? Because that's also important in tackling uh, poverty and uh, extreme poverty. So I'm going to ask, it's a very specific question, but I think it's an important one. And that question comes from Rose Hogan. Yeah, hi, uh, Rose. That's absolutely essential. And uh, we, we absolutely share the idea that uh, the, the first problem in the developing countries, especially, is uh, the, the, the fact that so many women are working on agriculture, but do not uh, you know, master uh, their uh, work, do not own the, 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 the fields and so on and so on. So that is uh, absolutely uh, right. And uh, we are going to put this topic on the uh, Gender Equality Forum that is going to be organized in France in a few months. But if you allow me, um, let me maybe uh, try to uh, answer another question that I have seen on the Q&A from Claire Lode. 
uh, who, are, who is uh, asking us, um, well, uh, whilst in Ireland the number of women studying engineering and science has increased, the number of men studying nursing or social work is not increasing in the same way. What would you suggest could be done to redress that imbalance, as I believe that full equality won't happen as long as some jobs are deemed feminine? She is so right. She is so right. And uh, to come back to your question, uh, you know, I hope the post-COVID world will recognize our vulnerabilities and the value of care, which should not be women's concern, but a concern for society as a whole. The lack of consideration for jobs, uh, which are mostly occupied by women today, uh, the jobs in the care area, this lack of consideration is frightening. And for me, it is linked to the fact that in our general unconscious, the functions occupied by these cashiers, housekeepers, other caretakers are merely the extension of the domestic field. A field which is discredited and is supposed to rest on women's shoulders in a kind of natural altruism or generosity. And we see it wrongly as a natural extension of the domestic field. That's why these jobs um, uh, don't have any uh, uh, right recognition um, of the harness of, uh, of, uh, of these jobs. Uh, that's why they are paid very badly uh, and are known to decrease life expectancy and so on and so on. So, to answer the question of, uh, of Claire, I will say that uh, you're right. We must um, uh, promote all these professions uh, to, to make them attractive, uh, including for, for men, um, attractive financially speaking, but also attractive uh, culturally spe speaking. And for that, um, television has a huge role to play uh, in my mind. Uh, I don't know if it is the same in uh, other countries, but when I look at my country, uh, look at the cooking shows uh, at TV, uh, which have a lot of, um, of uh, success uh, and um, increasingly bring men into the kitchen. So I think uh, we should have the same kind of promotion and you know, making the, 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 the jobs more attractive, uh, including other uh, dimension of the domestic area, uh, dealing with uh, children, uh, you know, uh, housekeeping and so on and so on. Same kind of uh, TV shows that should make all these um, functions more attractive. And I think that's something that we should really deal with. Yeah, that would be my conclusion. And I'm glad that you jumped in there and spotted that question. It was my next one. But Francis, you will also um, be very familiar with that issue as someone who started off in social work. But I actually have a specific question that's been coming for you. And I'd ask if all of our speakers are very brief because we literally have about three minutes left. But Francis, three, not even three minutes to ask this question. But Ian Hughes has asked, what is the difference in having one, two, three or four women in cabinet in terms of policy? That's a fair question. Yes, it is a very fair question and hard to summarize, but I would say it's obviously about hearing the voices of women and men. It's, it's about critical mass. When you have critical mass, you get a more, you get a fairer distribution of discussion. Um, I know, um, and I'll finish on this, when President Obama had his cabinet and uh, the women found that they weren't being listened to and they decided they'd go for what they called amplification, which means that if one woman said something, another woman would support her as opposed to one woman saying something, another man saying the same, and then whoever was leading the discussion saying, oh, that's a great idea, John, I'm forgetting that the woman had said it, which I, I had that experience again and again in all sorts of settings. So I think it's about voice. My own experience as well is that women behave less hierarchically in cabinet, um, which kind of surprised me, actually. I found that women were more, um, and it's hard to generalize because obviously there are always, uh, you know, differences and exceptions between uh, men and women are not for a moment suggesting a man might do this, but I often found that women were willing uh, to um, to call the elephant in the room and to uh, sort of say, but what about, you know, the fact that people are saying X or Y or that we're really concerned about this aspect of some legislation you're bringing in or some current issue. So I, I, I found a sort of a straightforwardness 
actually uh, in women and uh, less inclined to kind of go with the hierarchical you don't say anything which surprised me uh, in men but politics is very hierarchical and you're often dependent on leaders for positions so maybe that explains it but look at the, the main point I think is that you absolutely need the best thinking of women and men working together for our country and as you move from you know one to five women in, in cabinet you're getting different experiences reflected as well and you know very often I found women were very practical about issues as well in cabinet because you know, we bring, as uh, our contributors are saying, you just bring that experience of combining work and family life and, you know, housework and caring. And, you know, you bring it all together and you bring it to your politics as well. And Thanks, actually, Martina. Not all. Najat was smiling throughout that. So I know that she agrees in terms of political participation and having more women. Very briefly, Minister, um, what about you? Do you believe it makes a difference having more women around the cabinet table? You are serving in senior office at the moment. So, Minister, do you believe it is important to have more women in senior roles in politics? We, for yes, some of course. Obviously. And I hello. sincerely believe So what was I was saying in my remarks that here in Mali women in Mali and in other African countries as well women are naturally made to take responsibility and when they when they find themselves on the public in the public arena it is essential that they take responsibilities once we get there we have all these issues issues about for example climate change issues about education empowerment of other women women come to politics come into politics and give the best of themselves and i think yes we really have to lobby for women to have access to share political responsibilities thank you minister and also uh, thank you to all of our guest speakers today francis Fitzgerald, kadia tu conere thank you very much for joining us from mali and also najat balo balkasan who had to go just at at just there i would also like to thank the iea and the french embassy in particular the french ambassador to ireland vanson giron and the cultural councillor of the french embassy in dublin mariam dlo and all the iea team Cloda, hannah Lorcan, and also the interpreter, Veronica, who's do, done a, a huge amount of work uh, this morning. I think it was an important conversation. It was a frank conversation. It was only getting going. And it is hard to believe that this is the first International Women's Day event held by the IIEA. And I'm sure, given what's happened this morning, there will be many more. Happy St. Patrick. I was going to say happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> happy <laughs> International Women's <laughs> Day. Thanks, Martina. And thanks to everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.